Entrepreneurs can get stuck in their head. If you dream of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Ad Valued Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life and business. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life that they desire. You deserve it, and it is possible. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Publishing. Perfect Publishing is a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing is sharing a project of hope. We carefully chose heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at getadoseofhope.com. Getadoseofhope.com. Just wanted to mention this episode was recorded earlier. And as our audience grows, we just wanted to share some of the value from our earlier episodes. Our guest today is Bob Berg. For over 30 years, Bob Berg has been successfully showing entrepreneurs, leaders, and sales professionals how to communicate their value and accelerate their referral business. Although for years he was best known for his sales classic, in Endless Referrals, it's his business parable, The Go-Giver, co-authored by John David Mann, that has created a worldwide movement. Bob is an advocate, supporter, and defender of the free enterprise system, believing that the amount of money one makes is directly proportional to how many people they serve. He is also an unapologetic animal fanatic and served on the board of directors of Furry Friends Adoption and Clinic in his town of Jupiter, Florida. Bob Berg and I have a great conversation about his book, Endless Referrals, which led to the creation of the Go-Giver series written with John David Mann. We talk about the background of the mentor relationship and share some ideas for finding your own mentor to create the life that you want. Well, Bob, thank you so much for joining me today and jumping on the show. I appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation. My pleasure. Uh, the honor is mine. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So obviously, you know, you're famous for the go-giver and, and obviously are there four or five in the series now? Uh, four. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, and obviously those, those are terrific, but my, one of my favorites is, uh, ah. endless referrals. So an oldie. of course, same, uh, you know, same attitude, same mindset. And so definitely appreciate those. So would you mind sharing, um, how, how did go giver come about? How did, how did, uh, I guess, how did the five laws come about? Yeah, well, it actually came about based on endless referrals uh, because that was my that was my first book. That was the first edition of that, which has me uh, a picture of me on the telephone with jet black hair, which I actually <laughs> used to have. That was nice. back in the 90s. The, the edition you have is the third edition, which was in 2005, right? So okay. I actually at one time didn't have gray hair. And so uh, that, was the, that was my first book. And it was really written for entrepreneurs and salespeople who knew they had a great product or service. They knew it brought fantastic value to others, but they didn't necessarily feel comfortable or confident going into their local communities and building the kinds of relationships that would cause people to want to do business with them directly and or refer them to others. So uh, the, the premise of that book was that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. So Endless Referrals was a, a system, a guidebook, if, if you will, a how-to. Uh, but I'd always read um parables business parables since i'd been in sales and always loved them whether they were the long form you know or, or, or whether they were augmandino's richest man in babylon or class and uh, not richest man in babylon that was james classen's uh that was the second one i read uh or uh og's uh, greatest salesman in the world uh uh there was oh, there was all sorts of great parables uh then in the, the late 70s early 80s doctors blanchard and johnson with the one minute series one minute manager one minute salesperson one minute apology went right and then there were all these great you know parables and now of course you have people like chris widener john gordon and and so forth who are wonderful wonderful writers uh andrea um uh and uh 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 uh, Andrea and Richard, who uh, have the uh, go for no, which is a parable. So you got all oh, Andrea Waltz, Richard Fenton. So so you got all these great, great parables. But um, 
so I'd always thought, what if we could take that basic no like and trust relationship building premise of endless referrals and turn it into a um, uh, into a parable? You know, it. it I, I thought it would hit a much wider audience. It would hopefully bring value to the marketplace and 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 share some lessons in story form that would that would go over well. And but you know the 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 um, best thing I did was asking John David Mann to be the co-author and really the lead writer slash storyteller, because I'm a how-to guy, right? It takes all about two minutes talking to me to know I'm step one, step two, step three, so I'm boring. John is a magnificent storyteller, and and so um, that's really you know what we did. So yeah, it was first asking the question, entitling the book, so what is the essence of those people who are able to very quickly, but very sustainably, create those no like, and trust relationships, right? And it's that they're givers. Right. And so coming up with the go giver is pretty natural. And then the story part. So so what is it that, that John and I both because John was a great entrepreneur before he was a writer. And and so what is it that that we have both learned from years of, of experience of being out there and uh, and then me as a speaker for the last whatever it was, 20 years before that or whatever it was, uh, meeting so many people who achieved such massive success and asking them questions about how they did it and what were the guiding principles. John is a writer, a magazine writer, because that's actually how I met John. He was the editor in chief of a magazine I was writing for. And, and so he did those same kind of interviews. So we kind of pooled all that together, plus our extensive reading and learning in it, and came up with the five laws. And while the first couple of them were were very natural, the foundational principle of value and compensation and touching lives and all that. The rest of it, we always say kind of wrote themselves, <laughs> you know, because we, we figured that out, you know, as far as naming them. Now, see, the principles are, are nothing new, right? People used to have when the, when the, when the go-giver first came out and it got off to such a good start and people would say, well, so Berg, what is this? You and man, what have you written that's anything new in this book? And I'd always say, nothing. <laughs> I mean, these principles have been around. That's why they're principles, right? It's a, they've been around for you know forever. Um, we just kind of gave them names and put them in a story form. But um, but that's really you know that's really what what happened with that. That and that was the inspiration for it. Nice. Well, obviously that they've worked very well no, for a lot of people, and and obviously the 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 underlying truth of the five laws is is so powerful right because it, it really is about relationships and always and, is and helping people create business relationships and sales relationships rather than transactions and and that that change from a transactional sales model to to relational selling just just changes everything i think um yeah and, i think you're right and makes us better people right like mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean ultimately I believe entrepreneurs are the ones that are going to save the world. We're going to solve them, absolutely solve the problems, and 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 we're going to do that because we care about people. And you know something, and that's how it's been since market economies came into being. You know, uh, it's that that entrepreneur, the creator, the person with an idea, and that idea when it adds value to the marketplace, and people are allowed to to vote with their feet and with their wallets they'll make the decisions that are going to to help them and advance life uh for everybody absolutely so obviously each of the laws are valuable and 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 the networking i i think just endless referrals is just you know such a great I, you're a systems guy so it, it is it is such a great system of well you know robert you ask you know it when when, when the questions asked what is a system right you know, because I'm always using that word. I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, what is a system? And of course, it can be defined different ways. I have my own definition of a system. I say it's the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles. So, you know, if you if if it's been proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired results of B then you know all you need to do is A and continue to do A and continue to do A. And that's where Andrea and Richard's book, Go for No, comes in because no is an important part because along in, in utilizing that system, you're still going to get a lot of no's, right, along the way in any in any business. Uh, but if, if we know that's that it's predictable, then 
if we just keep doing it, we're going to get the results. Now, that doesn't mean the system should run us. No, the, the human runs the system. The system is there to work for us. So we don't get controlled by a system, right? <laughs> but we utilize it for everyone's benefit. Well, it's just, and it's, it's also part of that transition of recognizing the difference between an outcome goal and a process goal. Mm, and mm, it, mm, so mm. much, so much of us, you've got to have an outcome, right? You got to have a desire, but then you've got to be willing to let go of it and exactly. not, not hold on to that outcome and trust right. the process that you've created. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You, you've got to exactly, if it's a proven process, then you go with that and then you do it with, you know, without an attachment <laughs> to the outcome. You know, and because if you are attached to it and you put that kind of energy out and you start to panic when things don't go exactly as you want them to. Right. And that was, you know, that was my biggest issue when I first started. And I'd say up until my mid 30s. OK. And, and maybe even later than that, you know, I felt that my job was supposed to be general manager of the universe. <laughs> so I had to be in control of every result. Well, life doesn't work that way, at least not for me, right? And it was only when I let go of the attachment to the results and focused more on the things that I just needed to be doing in order to, to create the context, what we call, what John and I call the benevolent context for success. Mm -hmm. That's when things really started to happen. Yeah, it's challenging because we're, we're taught, right? You got to have oh. a goal. You got to have a goal. You got to have the end in mind. You got you to gotta know where you're going. And so we set up all these destinations right. and, and we lose track of the journey. <laughs> right. And all those, right. And all those things are fine. Right. And like you just said, if you don't lose track of the journey, all those things, the, the goals, the, the, absolutely, of course, um, we just can't be attached to them. Once we lose our attachment to those, then we can focus on the journey and, and we're going to get the results so much quicker. Absolutely. So how, how do you let go of that? Right? Like, how do you let go of that? Attachment? Yeah, the same way you get to Carnegie Hall practice. <laughs> nice. you, right? It, we've got to keep it in mind. Uh, I think the first thing is always awareness. Because I, if you had told me, well, you're Berg, you're always trying to control the outcome, I, I wouldn't have argued with you. I just wouldn't have understood what you meant. Because <laughs> it was just part of what I did. You know, it's that fish in the water, right? It just that's just how life is. I thought that's what I had to do. Well, and that's so, how business measures us, right? The business measures how many sales did you make or how sure. many pr products did you produce, right? The end of the the end of the manufacturing line, how many got in the box and how many boxes got on the truck? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. that's what they're checking at the end of the line. All right, you did a great job. We got a hundred boxes on the truck. <laughs> yeah. And, and but, forget about the process in between. Right. Well, exactly. And so it's not natural to check ourselves and say, hmm, is this what I'm doing, right? How do I, right? And so once we understand a thing, once we understand an issue, now we can go to work on it. And so for me, I had to just constantly be checking on myself when I'd feel that little bit of anxiety. Well, I'd have to say, why am I anxious right now? Well, I'm anxious because I'm trying to control an outcome because my sense of happiness is dependent upon whether this person says yes. OK, so now you say, OK, well, what do I do about this? Well, I have a choice. I can continue to be upset about it or I can let go, which, again, isn't necessarily easy. It takes practice. But I'll tell you, once you start doing that and making it your practice and making it your focus, wow, do things change? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, obviously, mentors aren't necessarily one of the five rules, but the entire book is based on a mentor relationship. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Tell me, tell me about mentors in, in your journey and, 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 and helping somebody to find, what would you recommend for somebody to, to find a mentor to come alongside them? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think mentors are a great thing because when you find the right mentor, it can cut your learning curve time by years. Right. Uh, and I, I think we intuitively know this and we'd all love to have that person who will, will kind of be that guide. Um, I think one of the things I see people doing, and, and this is not necessarily just lately, although I think it happens more lately because we have more access to people now through social media and so forth, through the internet that we otherwise wouldn't have. But, I, but I'd but i always seen people do this where they'll just kind of approach someone for whom they have great respect, but not necessarily a relationship with that person. And they say, hey, will you be my mentor, right? And and first, I, I think we've got to look at that a, a couple of ways, why why this might be kind of productive. Uh, one, if you want this person to be your mentor, the chances are a whole lot of other people do too. And mm -hmm. when you just simply ask, will you be my mentor? Uh, it, it doesn't distinguish you 
from anybody else. In fact, it, it comes across maybe as a bit entitled <laughs> and not right. You know what I'm saying? And it's 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 less likely this person's going to say yes. Not always, but just probably you know less likely. However, you know you you can pretty much ask anyone if you approach it the right way. So even if you don't have a, you know much of a relationship with this person, if you were to say to this person. You know, I understand you are very, very busy. And if this is something you either don't have the time to do or for whatever reason would just rather not, I absolutely <laughs> understand. I'm wondering if I might ask you one or two very specific questions. Mm, so good. Yeah. Now, when you do that, you've basically done three things. One is you've come across in, in much more of a humble way in which it's not, you know, you don't have any right to this person's mind, right? And you're, you're, you're letting them know this is a big ask. I understand you're very, very busy. You're also giving them an out or back door. You're letting them know right up front if they don't have time or they just rather not. Totally understandable and I accept absolutely. People enjoy having that out because people want control. They don't want to feel cornered. And the bigger the out or back door you give someone to take, the less they'll feel the need to take it. The mm -hmm. third thing you did was this. You didn't just say, can I pick your brain or basically communicate? Can I ask you mindless questions for, you know, three hours? You basically asked, could I ask you one or two very specific questions? questions. This says to this person that, first of all, you're not going to take up a lot of their time. Secondly, you know, you have an agenda. And I mean agenda in this, in this context in a good way, not you have an agenda, but you have an agenda. You know what you want to ask. You, that, so it's going to be quick for them. It's going to be easy for them. And you're someone who obviously has thought this out. And so it's not going to be a waste of their time. It's probably going to be pretty productive. Okay. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book, Dream Life Planner, Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered by Noel L. Peterson, available on Amazon, or you can order a personalized signed copy at empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, to dream.com. That's empower, number two, dream.com. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. Yeah, I think, you know, knowing knowing the question to ask, right, before you start the conversation, <laughs> what is it that you're really after um, yeah. is pretty important. Um, yeah. So what I, what I would do before the first conversation, of course, is I would make sure to really research this person mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of reasons. Just the more you know about them, the more confident you're going to be. Secondly, you won't mistakenly ask them something the answer to which you could have found out by reading an article of theirs or a an interview with them or something on the internet that probably you know what I'm saying yeah and, absolutely. and so so during the conversation you ask a couple of you you know, you're asking a couple of questions you don't take up much of their time they give you their their answers you thank them profusely you let them know how valuable their time is you look forward to applying the information right away and if it's okay with you I'll follow up and let you know how things are going and they're going to say oh of course absolutely let me know right okay now what i would do is immediately after leaving them getting off the phone or the skype or the uh, zoom or whatever because it can take place in any you know medium uh, is I would write a handwritten personalized note of thanks, not a text, not an email. Th those are fine, but not right now. I would write a handwritten personalized note, short and sweet, you know, dear Mr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so or Dave or Joanne or however the relationship's been established. Thank you so much again for your time. Your wisdom is immense and so greatly appreciated. Uh, as as we discussed, I'll I'll circle back with you and let you know how you know, things are progressing. Best regards, sign your name, put it in a, an envelope, hand, hand address it, hand stamp it, not, not meter machine, hand stamp, send it to them. And that will make a big impression. I would also find out, which again, you can research over the internet, or if worse comes to worse, you can always call and ask their, their administrative assistant, what's this person's favorite charitable cause? Right. And make a small, it doesn't have to be anything big, just a small donation in their name. Okay, it'll get back to them and you're not doing it to kiss up or anything, but just to let them know again that you respect the process, you're grateful to them, that you want to somehow add value to them in a way that's meaningful to them. Okay, now a couple weeks later, three weeks later, maybe you follow up and so forth and maybe you ask another question. And 
<coughs> they respond. And again, this goes on over time. See, a mentor-protege relationship is just that. It's a, it's a relationship, right? And, and these take time to develop. Now, let's go back to non-attachment, okay? You've just followed a great process, and maybe you have one or two conversations and that's it. Or maybe it turns into a great mentor-protege relationship. Don't be attached to the outcome. Whatever's supposed to happen with that will. You can ask someone, you might have a, a series of people you have one or two conversations with. And then it may be that you find that mentor that you meet with for three years. I, it, it, who knows? We don't know. But I, I think if you approach it that way, um, I think then you, you know, you, again, you create that context for a, a successful either relationship or series of, of such. Mm, so good. All right. So I'm going to ask a, a question that I haven't heard anyone else ask. <laughs> how, how did you guys come up with the name Pindar? Well, okay. So, so Pindar, cause we named different people after different people we knew. And some of them were actually conglomerations of people. It's, conglomeration is the right word. <laughs> a combination <laughs> there of, you go. Of, of people that we knew sometimes names, sometimes personality types. Pindar was the middle name of one of John's, uh, college professors who he really <laughs> liked. Pindar is also in, in mythology, a mentor, uh, right? And, and so, um, uh, by the way, his, his, um, the name of his professor was, uh, the middle name was Pindarus, not, not Pindar, but Pindar, you know, we took, so that, that's how we came up with the name Pindar. We that's went big. back and forth on the name, but, but, uh, I, I think he was right. That was a great name. <laughs> well, it's definitely, uh, memorable. Right. Yeah. Like it's not it's not going to be somebody that shows up as a CEO or something <laughs> somewhere. Um, so what I guess the, the other value, I guess, and maybe it's not a law in our lives, but the other area that I think is really important for entrepreneurs is is gratitude mm. and, and so being important. able to develop gratitude. And obviously, I think even in the process you just mentioned toward mentors, um, sending a thank you card, sending a contribution to a charity. Those are acts of gratitude um, and respect. And I think, um, I don't know, if I were to have a sixth law, it would be <laughs> the law of gratitude. Yeah, you know, I, I think you make a wonderful point. I, I believe that gratitude is the trait, and I believe it's a trait because I believe it's something we can develop. And I had to develop it in my life because I did not have that attitude of gratitude. Uh, again, that first 35 years or so of my life, I looked at things very half empty. I just, it was my thing, but I realized that that was really holding me back. And I made it a, a mission to develop gratitude. And it was a game changer for me. I believe gratitude is the trait that without which we cannot be happy. Mm. And the reason is because we can have all these blessings in our life and it doesn't have to be a boat or a, a, a private jet. It can be the fact that we can hear, see, touch, taste, smell, walk, uh, have dinner on the table and a roof over our head and a, a friends and a place to, you know what I'm saying? It's all the, the, it's that cup of coffee we can buy at the store and, and, and it's anything and everything. Okay. To, to be grateful for when we have this gratitude, we are happy. Happiness attracts, just like giving attracts. Happiness attracts. We want to be around happy people. And, and I just think it's, it's, it's such an important skill. And, and again, it was a game changer for me because once I made the decision that I was going to live in a state of gratitude, my life changed for the better. So good. Yeah, it's absolutely a trait. It absolutely can be learned. And, and just like the other uh, laws, it just needs to be practiced, sure. right? And, yeah. and it starts out as simple as being thankful for, for the small things every day. And, and you pick those things out and then you, you can start being thankful for everything. <laughs> it, it just yes, grows. Exactly. <clears throat> so what has been the impact uh, of being an author for your entrepreneurial journey? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's definitely helped very much. But, you know, when I first wrote Endless Referrals, I'd been speaking for about three years, I guess, four years. And, my, and the business was just beginning to, to really take off. And 
I went to a, a meeting of the National Speakers Association, uh, one of their their, their uh, yearly conferences, and I was speaking with a couple of the veteran speakers. They'd been around longer than I had, and they said, you know, Berg, where you are now, you're really at the point that you you should probably write a book. And I said, well, you know, I don't really want to. I've got these cassette tapes. That's how long ago this was, right? <laughs> Uh, kind of one step over a, an eight track tape, right? <laughs> and and I said, you know, and I'm I'm uh, you know I sell a lot of them from stage, and you know I get my fees, which you know back then weren't very much, but when you took the combine the two together, you know I was, I was doing okay. And I said, I really you know don't want to take the time and make that right. And they said, well, you know, uh, I, we understand that, uh, but here's the thing: if you do this, you're going to make yourself more marketable better positioned, uh, you're going to get higher fees, <laughs> be, be open more doors. And, and, you know, they were right. And so I wrote endless referrals just for the purposes of, for, of utility to, to help market myself as a speaker. And I used that book uh, as, a, as an outbound marketing tool more than anything else. And it just really added on to, to what I had already done. So, uh, so, I, so I'd say that that first book was written to basically help my speaking career. Um, but after that, I think every book I've ever either written myself or, or written in conjunction with, with John, John's the only person I've done, uh, uh, co-authorships with. So whether, whether with John, uh, or myself, every book after that has been just because I, I felt I had something to say that I wanted to share mm -hmm. and that you could do it better through a book because you can just reach so many more people with a book, you know, if you market, market it right. And if it's, if it's, uh, seen as being a value to the marketplace. Absolutely. Well, and really, I think that the go-giver is, is character development, right? All five of those laws are, are really you. developing um, character and, and helping Joe become, become the man he needs to be to live, live the life of his dreams, right? Yeah. And so the idea of designing a life that you love or building, building your business around a life that you love, could you, could you speak to that a little? Well, I mean, I, I think, Robert, that there is nothing, no one more fortunate than the person who every day gets to do what he or she loves to do, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, I've always said when, when people say, well, what kind of business should I go into or what should I do? You know, I've always said, well, you know, no one can can choose that, of course, or decide that, but, but you, but there are a few basic principles one i think is to to do something that you really love i mean that just it, it sounds very simple right but if you love to do it you're going to be able to do it you know by the way there's been a movement over the past few years of saying well forget about what you're passionate about just do the do the work and you'll get your passion but and i'm not disrespecting that or arguing with that it, they have a point of uh, in, uh, that as well but i think in terms of of real world kind of thing I've met very, very few people who've done immensely well, and I'm talking about financially as well as just loving their work, who didn't love their work. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, the, 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 I should say people who've been successful in all the ways that people can be successful typically loved what they, what they did. Okay, I think that is important. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. There are some people who can do something that they hate but makes a ton of money and they'll find a way to do it and keep doing it. But boy, is that tough. Can you imagine living a life where every day you just hated getting up and going to work, even though you knew there was a financial benefit? Tough. Uh, again, people can do it, but very difficult. So I think loving what you do, I, I think that's very, very important. Second is to do what you're good at or, or can be developed. Um, Typically, the way we seem to be built as human beings is what we're good at, we tend to also enjoy, <laughs> okay? Now, that's not always true. You know, we, I mean, I wanted, growing up, I wanted to be the uh, third baseman for the Boston Red Sox. Nice. Uh, right. Oh, absolutely. Great, great <laughs> idea. I just had no talent, okay? So, however, uh, I went into as being a sportscaster. All right. That was my first job. You know, nice. that's something I thought I was always going to do. I didn't for long and I wasn't particularly great at that. I was okay. But, but I could, but you know, what if instead you had a, um, some kind of, uh, um, 
you know, blog or other business in which you served baseball fans or, you know, you can always keep, if you love doing something, you can always find a way to be around it. Okay. So, or you could, I could have been a baseball executive had I wanted to, or, or, you know what I'm saying? Or been in the business in, in some way. Um, so, so again, what you love, you know, what you have a passion for and what you're good at. And that's two of them, but there's one more too. And here's where I think a saying comes in. If we leave out this third one that I'm going to talk about next is where a saying comes in that is well known and it's good, but it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. And that is where people say, follow, just go with your passion and the money will follow. <laughs> it sounds great, but again, I, I don't think it's complete because it misses that third aspect. You've got to have people who will buy <laughs> what you're doing. You've got to have a market for it, either one that's out there or one you can develop. OK, but, you know, otherwise, if you're doing what you love and what you're good at and no money's coming in, you've got a hobby. <laughs> hobby great. I recommend them, you know, but you, that's different from a, a viable business. So so you do what you love, you do what you're good at, and you've got to connect that with a willing marketplace. Well, it's really finding the problem you solve. Right. Um, uh, ultimately, exactly. We. I believe all of us were created with a gift inside of us to serve humanity in some valuable way. Mm -hmm. And that valuable way is going to solve a problem or yeah, absolutely you know, time. It's either going to create more time or it's going to help them make more money, or it's going to, mm -hmm. it's going to, you know, it's going to speed things up or, or, you know, solve a problem. I mean, sure. even as simple as plumbing, a plumber solves absolutely. a problem. Absolutely. <laughs> and, absolutely. And, absolutely. and so I, that's where entrepreneurs are going to save the world is because they're the ones that, are they're solving they're, problems. They're, they're agile they're, enough yeah. to, to transition. Mm -hmm. And then when they're successful, they can support and solve, you know, all kinds of social issues that, that corporations just Absolutely. can't shift to of solve. Course. So yeah. I love that. So you, you mentioned in there, the audience and, and having a market. Um, what, how do you recommend, you know, building that market? Obviously, you know, your, your, uh, um, endless referrals is really about creating relationships that help you identify those mm -hmm. people that need you <laughs> or those people that you can serve. Um, yeah. What other tools would you recommend for well, helping people build that market? Yeah. I mean, I, I think really what it comes down to is identifying a market. I think it's easier to identify a market that's already out there <laughs> uh, rather than one you need to create. But you know, of course, if you create a new market, well, now you're, you know, now you're Steve Jobs rich, you know, and so, <laughs> but, uh, but there's plenty, uh, you know, that there, there's plenty of income that can be earned from just serving a marketplace that's already out there. I, I think a key to look at is first, do they need what you have to offer? Okay. Now, if they need it, then you've also got to add, and this is what I call the marketing bridge. Do they need it? Okay, good. Do they want it? Because if they need it, but they don't want it, they ain't getting it, <laughs> right? And so now do they need it? Do they want it? And then the third of the marketing bridge, can they afford it? <laughs> okay. Now, if your product is something that they don't necessarily need, they just want, then you just skip that first part of the marketing bridge. But I'm talking about a product that's one that's needed in the marketplace. Do they need it? Great. Do they want it? Or are they willing to accept that they need it so much that they will want the results, right? <laughs> Enough to, right? Even though they may not want to have to do the thing. And then can they afford it? If you've got all three of those covered, well, now you have a market. But there's one more thing about that too, that I would say. Have it be one that you enjoy serving. <laughs> if you're niching, Right. I remember a, a woman I, I knew who was the she was a consultant to the dental industry and and she provided a great product, great service. Actually, um, they needed it. They wanted it. They could afford it. But when I was in conversation to her, you know what I was most impressed with? She said, I just love these dentists. Mm. I love what they're doing. I love how they care about what they're doing. It's such a joy and an honor to serve them. And she was making a lot of money. OK. You know, it's it's that, you know what I'm saying? When you really, really, really love your marketplace and it's a joy, it's an honor to serve them, now you're in your wheelhouse. I think the biggest challenge for people is they want to pick a market that's just too big. And and they're afraid to narrow it down to, to dentists that wear blue coats on Thursdays. I mean, 
but right. the truth is if you find that smaller market that you love yeah. to serve it focuses your message and it focuses oh, sure. so much for you on your end that it makes it really does build better relationships it makes that group of people feel like hey this is the guy that's serving just you know just who i am that, that i'm the perfect fit and, and yeah. it has a whole different feel well you become the expert the go-to but here's the really cool thing about this too. And, and this is when people say to me, but yeah, if I, but if I niche too specifically, I'm get, losing so much more of the potential marketplace. So don't worry about that at first, because right now you're not big enough to have a whole marketplace, mm -hmm. but you, but you can certainly do great with a, a, a niche, but here's the, here's the neat thing. Become an expert in that niche, do great with that niche. And all of a sudden you'll start expanding outwards naturally because someone in that niche refers you to someone else, introduces you to someone else. Now, all of a sudden, you've got another niche or you've just got more of a general marketplace aside from that niche, right? And so, I mean, I started out very niched and then I went general because it just kind of expanded. Absolutely. Bob, I have been just so much wisdom that you've shared. Uh -huh. a young entrepreneur is sitting across from you and you've got the chance to share Bob's words of wisdom as you say goodbye. What, what would you share? I would I would share the advice of an older gentleman back when I was a young entrepreneur and needed this particular piece of advice. He said, Berg, he was a he was a last name kind of guy. He <laughs> said, Berg, if you want to make a lot of money in business, a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target is serving others. Now, when you hit the target, he said, you'll get a reward. And that reward will come in the form of money. And you can do with that money whatever you choose. But never forget, he said, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It's not the target itself. Your target is serving others. And this is why John David Mann and I say that money is simply an echo of value. Money is an echo of value. Focus on the value you're providing others and the money you receive will be a very natural result of the value you've provided. Bob, that is so good. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Robert. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, or leave a review. We have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com. That's addvaluemindset.com. We've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast, and we want to give them to you for free. addvaluemindset.com. In our next episode, Jimmy Nelson discusses the power of a story to get an emotional response and the ability to help people get a quick win. Coach Jimmy talks affiliate marketing and the power of community to build each other's business. Jimmy is passionate about personal growth and helping others find the success story within.